Hello, darlings. You've all heard of Marilyn Monroe. Hello, darlings. Welcome back to Cognac's Corner. I'm TV host, entertainment journalist, Cognac Willa Lane. You're probably wondering why I have this black top hat on. Well, there is a reason. This hat is all about, this particular top hat is all about the famous international, world-renowned artist, Kevin Berlin. He never goes anywhere without his famous top hat. His famous, and in just a moment, darlings, I will be interviewing world-renowned, international, famous artist, Kevin Berlin. Let's take a look at this fascinating artist. Welcome back, darlings. I'm TV host, entertainment journalist, Cognac Well Elaine. And we are here in my pink kitchen, and I have the world famous artist. He is an acclaimed artist, an international artist from all over the world. He's recognizes one of the most famous artists in the world, Mr. Kevin Berlin. And we're, he's coming to us all the way from Florence, Italy, one of his many homes. And I'm wearing his famous top hat that he gave me. Welcome, Kevin, to my pink kitchen. As you can see, I live in a pink house, a pink home. And I'm so excited to talk to you today but I want to uh, tell my audience a little bit more about you, if that's okay with you. Is that okay? Buongiorno. Buongiorno. Uh, while you're doing that, I'm going to have some real Italian espresso. Go so right ahead. Kevin Berlin is an international artist best known for painting, sculpture, and performance. Berlin currently lives in many residences in Southampton, New York, and Florence, Italy, which he is residing in right now. Kevin Berlin is a Yale University alumni. He studied at the Slade School of Fine Art and has appeared in the New York Times Magazine, Shanghai Daily, the Miami Herald, USA Today, MTV, Tokyo Television, BBC Radio, and over 40 television stations. Kevin Berlin's works are found in collections including Kim Bassinger, George Bush, Quincy Jones, who I've interviewed, Quincy Jones, Buzz mm. Aldrin, Barton G, Princess Antonella, The Orleans Bourbon, and Pieta Enrique, Sanders. So welcome to the show. Welcome. Remember this? Remember this picture that you gave me? Oh, that was the, the launch in Southampton of Kevin Berlin, New York Top Hats. I, I, I had, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I couldn't find a top hat that I really loved and I decided to make my own. Uh, and that was launched, I think it was 2015 or so, in Southampton. And those were several of my international top hat models. These girls are beautiful. Do you still work with these girls? Uh, I'm still in touch with, uh, let's see, with uh, Lucy and also with Jennifer. And Lucy's in Australia now. She has her own swimwear line. And uh, Jennifer's in a lot of music videos. You made these girls famous. Famous. So we're going to get into now why, what inspired you to become an artist. Tell my audience what happened to make you love art and to make you want to be an artist. Tell us the story. Well, the first thing I'd say is I think an artist is like everybody else. Um, except that when I was a little kid, painting and sculpture always came very easy to me. I won a lot of national poster contests and things like that. And I just decided that I could try and 
spend my life doing something that I love to do. And so the difference between me and a lot of other kids is I never stopped painting and I never stopped drawing. You know, some kids move on to skateboards and baseball and I just kept going. And over time, I started to realize that there is always something new to discover every day. That was one of the things that was always said about Picasso, that he found something new every day. And for example, Matisse painted until he was 89 years old, never got bored. Michelangelo here in Florence, um, he did, I think, almost a third of his work after the age of 60, including the wow. Sistine Chapel ceiling. And when I was 18 in high school, uh, I came to Florence for the first time on a, a field trip in, from suburban Maryland. And I saw the David for the first time and I tried to sketch him in my sketchbook and I couldn't. I just stared and stared. It was the first time I ever saw something that was so I, I profound, seen, right? I, I, I couldn't draw it. And so at some point I realized when I went off to college, I had always thought I would be a, a doctor or something like that because um, I started painting nudes when I was 12 years old at the Corcoran School of Art. Um, I painted a lot of landscapes, but I always, I never thought that the, uh, I studied a lot of anatomy and physiology, but I never thought these things would apply to a life as an artist. And as it turns out, all that early training um, helped me today. And right now I'm actually back in Florence. Um, I came here, um, well, off and on for many, many years now, um, since that first visit when I was 18. Um, and I thought I would try the Dolce Vita. I love the Hamptons, but sometimes it's nice to, uh, to get away. And well, I understand I that you were under, you're still, you were under quarantine, like lockdown well, in Florence for, a, but they opened up again. Am I right about that? You are right. We have been locked down pretty much for more than a year. Sometimes it's a little more open, but until three days ago for a full month, we were in something called Codice Rosso, which means code red. Basically, you can only leave the house for a walk to go to a doctor or get some food. And well, there's been a be pentium quarantine. Well, if you're going to be, excuse me, if you're going to be under quarantine, what better city to be under quarantine than in Florence, Italy? It's such a magnificent city. It's so gorgeous. I, I've... I had the extraordinary experience of, uh, you know, walking by the Christmas tree in front of the Duomo on uh, Christmas Eve. Nobody is there. Uh, on Easter, walking around uh, Campanile, the big tower of Giotto, uh, nobody's there. Um, so it was a very, uh, very extraordinary. Yeah. Luckily, I'm, I'm locked down with my girlfriend. And I'm locked down at my, my uh, amore and also a lot of art supplies. So I'm able to keep working. And my school, I'm studying Italian. I always wanted to really master the Italian language. You know, maybe not like a poet like Dante, but really uh, express myself in Italian. And school is on Zoom. And I'm doing a lot of things uh, I saw virtually. That, that you, yes, I saw that you are teaching now. Tell my audience about that. How did you get involved with the teaching of the students on Zoom? Tell us a story about that. Believe it or not, when I was 18, which was, I think, 37 years ago, my high school art teacher brought, me, brought his class to Florence. And this same teacher has four schools in Maryland. The main one is called the Yellow Barn Studio. His name is Walter Bartman. And he invited me. He said, hey, I know you're home. Maybe you should teach a class for me. And... Uh, he's someone who's a dear friend and someone I've known for years. And I just looked around and said, I'm here anyway, I'll do it. And so the classes are called portrait and self-portrait um, because self-portrait, of course, the three most famous uh, artists, Van Gogh, Rembrandt and Frida Kahlo are all known for self-portraits and a self-portrait you can do while you're, while you're stuck at home. Um, and it's been a big discovery for me because uh, you kind of had a chance to re-examine and rethink all the things you know. And I never, I've always heard how important it is to give back and to think about other people, but you'll find this with a lot of artists are really in a hurry. You know, we want to just uh, say everything we can, like that Shakespeare, you know, tomorrow and tomorrow creeps on and it's petty pace and, to the, and you know, that we're not going to have time. 
And this gave me a chance to slow down, take a deep breath, and maybe give something back because I didn't realize how lucky I was to have such great teachers all this time. And I didn't realize how unique my art education was because I spent my whole life just trying to be a better artist and to uh, have a better, uh, a clearer vision of the world and, and try and say something important. And I think that's the most challenging thing. And all of my work is about the idea of talking about important uh, social issues, whether it's the tiger going extinct, whether it's uh, how we use our cell phones. Um, uh, and so uh, I've, I've tried to uh, use the time to really express, uh, express myself. Um, so it's been a reward. It's been very rewarding. The classes are still ongoing, moving on to portraits. You're still working um, on that, right? You're teaching them portraits. Absolutely. What else, you, what else do you teach them besides portraits? Is there another class that you're teaching besides portraits? Um, yes, the next class coming up is going to be called Taking Care of Business. Um, I, I've discovered that uh, for some reason, art schools almost never teach an artist how to earn a living. Right. Uh, how do you, it's how like do you acting. get through? It's like acting. They teach you how to become a good, I'm an actress too. They teach you how to become a good actress, but they don't teach you the business aspect of behind being an actor. And that's very important because it, there's two parts when in entertainment. There's show and there's business. And that's why it's called show business. Right. Hey, yeah. And there's there's no business like show business, as exactly. my distant uncle Irving Berlin once said. Um, yeah. So I, I found uncle? that. Really? Is no, that <laughs> we're still checking. Like, maybe okay. a cousin. Who knows? Oh, no. um, that is your real name, though. Kevin Berlin is your real I name. I saw my passport from the day I was born. That's that uh, is. Th though I don't though I do go by different names in different countries, but usually very uh, common names. I have a different name in about 12 countries. In China, I'm known as uh, now don't repeat this is kind of secret, but, you know, um, uh, in China, I'm known as Jali. Uh, in Russia, they call me Boris, Boris uh, Petrov, Boris Ivanovich Petrov. In uh, Belgium, I'm Jan Janssens. Uh, of course, I have an Italian name, but in, uh, in New York, uh, Miami, uh, Alaska, uh, and also London, uh, just Kevin. You really have traveled to every single place in the world. Is there any place you haven't been to? There's one place that I, that I would really like to go, and I probably shouldn't mention it because it's going to get crowded, but I have been dreaming about going to the Komodo Islands, where the last of the Komodo dragon, which is the largest living land reptile, it's somewhere near Bali in a little island, they have a beach with pure pink sand, and I've been dreaming wow. about going there. And that could be your next project, painting that lizard. That pink, uh, pink lizard. I was actually hoping to go to uh, one of the conservancies in Kenya and working with rhinos because, you know, the rhinoceros is, is deeply endangered right now. And because of the pandemic, the resources uh, for rangers and people protecting the rhinoceroses and the various sanctuaries has gone way, way, way down. So it's a very, very desperate situation for for the rhino right now. And I'd love to do a story about uh, rhino rangers, about these uh, men who are risking their lives every day to uh, protect the rhinoceros. Um, so that, that's definitely on my list, but it is very, very canceled. Yeah. And the other thing that, I, that uh, I had planned to do just before the pandemic, I was all set up to go to, believe it or not, the Wudang Mountains oh my God. In, uh, in China. Um, I wanted to learn sword fighting because a paintbrush is a lot like a sword. And when I was 37 years ago also, um, I studied the slaves. Is that how long you've been painting? Around 40 years you've been an artist. Um, I since, I was, since I was five or six. So very, very, very little, like every kid. Like every kid. But what I discovered in the, is that in the Wudang Mountains, they're, they're famous for Wudang sword. And I found my Kung Fu master from when I studied in London. And on Zoom, secretly, I've been learning to use the, uh, the butterfly sword. 
uh, which is like a paintbrush, because I thought if I could master a paintbrush, using a sword would also really help me. And I'm also learning the staff. This is a wooden staff. Um, looks and like I'm hoping that this Moses is like used, It looks like something Moses used to carry around. It's, it's, uh, it, it's a chance to, uh, to bring uh, the Wudang Mountains to me. My original plan last February of 2020 was to go there and study uh, uh, sword fighting for, for about a month. And I told my personal trainer out here in Florence, uh, I said, hey, um, you've got to get me in shape. I need to be able to do Kung Fu sword for six hours a day. And he looked at me and he said, well, I could get you ready to do one hour a day. And, um, and then as it turned out, uh, last uh, January, he said, guess what? You don't have to worry about being ready for six hours of sword fighting because in Wuhan, it looks like there's some kind of a, a pandemic started. And that's when this started. And we had no idea, had no idea that, that uh, you know, I thought it was a couple of months, things would slow down. And it is something that has been world changing. And it's also something that has been very challenging for people in the arts. And I don't just mean well, the visual arts, but also no, the performing it's arts. Show business, everything, everything. You know how many filmmakers and actors and directors, they're all crying to me. They can't get their movie off the ground. Cause I interview a lot of filmmakers and I put their trailers inside the interview. I'm always getting people telling me that this is like the biggest challenge of their life, what they're going through right now. It's, it's so sad. I just hope that, you know, pretty soon we'll be back to the way we were. I don't know if we ever will be completely, but it's, I hope it's, to God we will be. I just pray every day that we will be. It's going slow. For example, the dance schools, even for one person to train in a day have pretty much been shut in Italy. And how can you learn pirouettes if you can't move at all? Um, so I've worked on it. You know, I've worked on a number of projects inspired by the pandemic, um, which I had yeah, never I planned to, to do. I wanted to talk to you about really how mm -hmm. the pandemic has really affected your art. But you're pretty much answering that question right now as we do this interview, how much you've done while the pandemic has been going on. And, but I, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, tell us, tell us, in your opinion, this is what, as you as an artist, tell us in your opinion what you think makes a brilliant piece of art or even a masterpiece. Oh, I think that's, uh, I think that's easy, though I don't know if I could put it into words, but you're asking me to, to speak poetry. But right. I can tell you this, and this is one of the reasons that I love being in Florence, and during the pandemic, I've had a chance to go in the Uffizi Museum and see the Botticelli rooms and stand in front of the birth of Venus or the Primavera with no one else but a guard in the room, like you were in a living room. And I love to be around masterpieces because I can't tell you what a masterpiece is, but I can tell you that if you surround yourself with masterpieces, there's something in common about all of them. Um, whether, it's a, whether it's a work by Da Vinci or Rembrandt or, um, you know, or uh, David Hockney, for example, um, there's, there's something that will make you a better person. And each time I work on a painting, even if I paint a tomato, which I happen to have a real Italian tomato. This is not retouched, no filter. That's an actual Italian tomato. Um, even if I paint a tomato, to me, each painting is, each tomato is a miracle. It's a new world. And I think when you look at a masterpiece, you have this sensation that it was worth waking up in the morning. You have the sensation that everything is worth it, that there's a reason that we're here. That it, that it was worth waking up in the morning. And also when I, each time I paint or when I work on my large bronze sculptures, for example, where I'll be working with a ballet dancer for, you know, for, for two years at a time, a couple times a week on a big sculptures. Um, we always say the same thing. I tell her we have one goal, capolavoro. And capolavoro is the word for masterpiece in Italian. 
Capo, and how do you say capo? Vello? Capo, capo, uh -huh. like like a, a the boss, the capo, like you've seen capo. on the Sopranos. And capo lavoro bello. means and lavoro means work. Capo, capo lavoro it means like boss work, but it means a masterpiece. And the main thing is whether you're painting a tomato or a cup of coffee. Each time you start, you have in your mind fixed you want to make a masterpiece. Now, maybe you'll fail, maybe you'll fall way short, but everything that you do with this goal is going to get you in that direction and seeing real masterpieces, being in front of, uh, you know, a painting by Raffaello, even if it's just a self-portrait when he was very young, will help you understand, I want to do something like that. I want to do something that I've never been to the Grand Canyon, but I understand when you see it, you lose your breath. That's a masterpiece. And yes. God, God made that. God made that. Yes. Now, let me ask you something. Uh, how do you think your art has evolved? You as well, an artist. My work has always been painting and sculpture. And about 20 years ago, I started working on performance art. Um, and nobody knows exactly what a performance art piece is. You've, you've attended, you know, all the events with Robert Wilson in uh, the Watermill Center where he's got right. performing artists from all over the world, uh, uh, sort of a, a factory or training ground for performance art. Um, but I found I use performance art when I don't know how else to tell my story. Um, if you like the color, you should paint it. If you like the shape, or the form or how it moves with gravity, maybe you should make a bronze sculpture. And especially if you wanna make something permanent that people can interact with for hundreds of years. But sometimes you have something to say and you need to write it. And sometimes performance art is the way and with this uh, creation of um, a communication through the internet, like we're doing now, this is a miracle that you and I are talking on Zoom right um, now. I, I can't tell you how much I love the Zoom. I, you know, as you know, I used to love to go to all the parties and the charity galas and all the red carpet ceremonies, events, and interview all these people on the red carpet. But I have to tell you, I really love the Zoom because when you're on the red carpet, you know, you're chasing after the movie star or, you know, you're all mm. messed up. You got lipstick on your teeth. Your boob is popping out. You know, something is happening that just that's supposed to be happening. But here in the Zoom, you know, I look perfect. I'm relaxed. I'm sitting here and I, I, I could talk to you for 20 minutes. Where on the red carpet. I, I'm lucky if I have like three minutes with a celebrity. So I cannot tell you how much I'm really, really thankful that I'm here doing the Zoom with you at right now. I think it's right when, when you reached out to me last week, it was so easy. You sent me a message. Would you like to do an interview? And I sent back a message. Yes. Of course. And how could you it's not? Very special tonight um, because I know there's so much chaos in the world. And I think sometimes it's important to just take a deep breath. And um, for the next about a minute, um, we'd like to take a break and just have a poetic moment. So I hope you'll uh, watch right now.
Okay, now we can finally put every microphone on and uh, have questions and answers. talk to you about you love to paint from experience which you yes. were talking about before now you like to paint the ballet you yes do performance art you do party scenes you know it sounds so much like toulouse Lautrec when he used to paint french society at the moulin rouge was he one of your what like did you want to emulate some of these artists that we've seen like I, Michelangelo I have... and these other people of course, I've been to uh, Toulouse, uh, where where uh, he was from. Um, I find that that the best way to talk about something is to have done it yourself. I, I think it was uh, Einstein who said, um, uh, "You you learn by doing," and he was really smart. And so, the idea is that um, if you want to say something important, you better know what you're talking about. And for my work, whether it's my ballet work or it's a painting of a cocktail party, I want the viewer to uh, feel something the same way you'd feel something if you heard your favorite Beatles song or your or your favorite, uh, uh, you know, pop song by uh, by someone today. I want you to feel something and how I want even if you're an expert, I want you to appreciate my work. And if you don't know anything and anything at all about ballet, I still want you to appreciate it. And I find the only way to do that is to make an expert yourself. So when I force myself for authenticity is to find the location where I can learn the best and go there. For example, I wanted to work with tigers uh, a few years back because I understood they were going extinct. And I thought, where can I get near a tiger? So I moved to Ukraine and joined the circus. I work with the National Circus in Kiev, uh, which is a cultural institution for more than 100 years. And I got near tigers. And without being next to a tiger, um, it's impossible right? to know. I was more than scared. Oh As a matter God. of fact, my mother has suggested I get some very fast shoes, but oh. um, in case a tiger got out. But of course, as you know, you can't outrun a tiger if heaven forbid no. one got out. If you hear a tiger even breathe, and I was near tigers when they're eating, uh, when they're uh, sleeping, if you hear one even breathe, you will feel on the back of your neck, each hair sort of, I'm not sure how to, the right word, but you'll have a it's sensation. Terrifying. I know, it's terrifying. You'll have a sensation that some prehistoric DNA inside of you understands that you are just meat and that you are powerless. And I understand how, if confronted by an animal as beautiful or powerful as a tiger um, in nature, it would be, uh, you would just freeze. It would be uh, terrifying. And I, I gained great, great respect by being near a tiger. I did the same thing. I moved to one morning. Was that the most challenging? Was that, was, would you say that was the most challenging thing you've ever done? Being near the, the most tiger? The most challenging thing I, I did, um, probably besides I went to an elephant uh, research project in Africa and came home with malaria and a number of other things, uh, um, uh, a number of other dangerous you know, experiences that I wouldn't recommend to anyone. One morning I'm, I woke up, this was just after 9-11. Um, I had a show that opened in Paris on 9-11. It was called Sex and Drugs, New York. It was all paintings of bodyguards and bartenders. Also authenticity. I attended a zillion parties in New York to talk about the New York nightlife. And the show opened on 9-11. That's a loose like track. That's what he and used then, to do. And, the, like yes, and then the gallerist and his mother tried to steal the whole show. They oh figured he's God. from New York. His city was bombed. Let's rob him. And at that time, I came to Florence and because I just And this was in learned, Paris? This was in Paris? The reception for the exhibit was on September 11, 2001, three hours after the attack. We couldn't even cancel it. Oh, where it was, was it? In it, Paris? It was in Paris, on Rubo yeah. Borg. It was, it was uh, terrifying, but 
at just afterwards, I decided I just wanted a nice place to wake up in the morning. And I came to Florence for a couple of weeks. And it was at that time I read a newspaper article that said it was the 300th anniversary of St. Petersburg, Russia. And so I moved to Russia. And I worked with the Kirov Ballet where Tchaikovsky wrote Swan Lake, Sleeping Beauty and the Nutcracker. And somehow I was kind of like a baby crossing a highway and nothing happened. I just showed up in Russia knowing a friend of a friend of a friend. And eventually I spent nine months backstage with the Kirov Ballet and worked with more than 50 dancers. Some of the, in Russia, ballet is almost like a religion. It's, uh, it's caviar, it's, um, uh, it, it's it's very, very uh, extraordinary dedication to art. And working in Russia really changed a lot of things about my work. That's when I got serious about, uh, uh, opened my eyes and got serious about ballet. And it was very, very challenging because I didn't speak Russian. Um, I knew nothing about ballet. I got nearly thrown out of the Vaganova Academy because I knew so little about ballet. And I suggested, like you mentioned Lautrec, uh, I mentioned Degas. Um, I thought, well, if you're going to start with something, what better place than start at the Vaganova Academy where, you know, Anna Pavlova and Nijinsky right. um, started training. So I got the perfect first introduction. I started late, but um, but that the year in Russia was very uh, challenging, and, I, and I've been right back to Russia a number of times working on, um, on more ballet projects, including a couple that will be in my new viewing room. Now, that's what I want to talk to you about. You now, because of the pandemic, have mm -hmm. done various projects. You've done a viewing room, you've done the moonwalk, you've done this ballet that you've been talking about, the Swan Lake. Tell me, Lois, briefly a little bit about this, because we're going to be closing soon. When I, when I found the pandemic created, uh, oh, let me say it this way, um, sometimes uh, the most challenging situations uh, create the greatest opportunities. Right. You're right. Absolutely. And the first thing I did um, at the beginning of the pandemic, and I did not plan it, I was walking in the Piazza Signoria, which is one of the most famous squares in the world. It's where the Statue of David is outside. I know, I've been there, and, I yeah. know. <clears throat> and you know, it's, a, it's the place you would go if you went to Florence. Usually there's between 50 and 500 people there. It was empty. It was desolate. It was like the world had ended. Um, it was like uh, there were like only a ghosts. Bomb hit us. There was only the ghost of Michelangelo walking around, something like that, like a zombie movie. Yeah, and, it was like that here in Times Square too. And I, I happen to have a beekeeper suit, and uh, and these new orange shoes, which I never wore. Uh, and I decided to make a video film by myself, and I called it Moonwalk. And I, I was able to use the music from. Pink Floyd, The Dark Side of the Moon. And it's a very short video, but it's about the experience of walking almost in slow motion in this beautiful square, in this very um, uh, surreal, separate world that you could not imagine could ever happen. And yet here, this is really happening around you. It's not imaginary. The square is empty. Um, so Moonwalk was the first piece. And at the moment, I just wanted to focus on the idea of offering um, strength, uh, some personal courage, you know, in this time that's uh, been very difficult for really for everyone. everyone. Um, and, and I followed the video. About, tell us about your viewing room. That's another oh, thing I want you to I'll jump about. right to the viewing room. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what you're going to discover is all the major art fairs for pretty much the last year and a half have been fully canceled and have more or less gone online. So all that excitement of Art Hamptons or Art Basel or the Freeze Art Fair, it's all no more. But the art market has adjusted to it extremely well, at least on the high end, at least on the end for artists who are already yeah, really Yeah, because recognized. you know what this one, one, uh, one of the artists out here in the Hamptons told me that we didn't think we were going to do well. She says, but you know what it is? Everybody's in the very wealthy people. She's they're all in their houses and they're not going anywhere. 
So they look at the walls and they look at, the, they're in their house. So they figured, well, I'm in my house. I'm looking at the walls. Let's go buy some art. So, so it actually, and they're not buying clothes. They're not spending no. money on <laughs> dinners, fancy parties and dinners. So they're spending the money, I think, on the art because they want to look at pretty things in their house. Ab I absolutely. Uh, and especially people who have a, a new home or a second or a third home with right. empty walls. It must be heartbreaking to uh, just look at it. So if you look at some of the statistics from Art Basel, which just came out with a very complex report, and they're probably the the experts, you know, from Switzerland on this, they suggest that art market has done pretty well overall, not as well as previously. <clears throat> but the question is, how do you adapt? And this is something that I'm going <clears> to <throat> mention, which applies to everybody, whatever art you're in. Bef when they first invented email, I received a message. Um, this was a long time ago in New York City. And this is when you didn't look at a post on Facebook or something. You actually got an email. There was, there was no social media. And it said a quote from Charles Darwin about the survival of the fittest. And it said the species most likely to survive <clears throat> is not the most intelligent. It's not physically the strongest, but it's the most responsive to change. In other words, if it gets 10 degrees colder, you better get feathers. Actually, you probably have feathers or fur. That's uh, I have fur. I have fur. or pink and feathers. I have feathers too. <laughs> but so what's happened is that the people that have responded to change have done very well. For example, yeah. if you remember a company called Kodak, well, they used to be the most important ph photographic company in the world. But when they invented digital pictures, Kodak said, oh, that's a fad. It's like the moon ring and uh, hula hoop. Well, they were wrong. And this pandemic doesn't seem to be a fad. And just waiting for everything to open doesn't seem to be the, the answer. And so artists like myself, I've been developing over the last uh, couple of months, a new series of videos. And online, I've done what so many galleries are doing until my galleries open up and everything's back to normal, uh, what they call a viewing room. And basically a viewing room, they usually don't have prices, um, but they have uh, some descriptions, some quotes, some uh, special photos, some unique information or videos about the artist is kind of like being in a virtual uh, space and it gives a collector a chance to peruse, to browse, to look at new work. And if there's something you like, uh, in this case, you can contact the artist directly. Um, uh, of course, you want to be represented by your gallery, but the galleries understand that artists have to they do have some to business eat. too right now. Yeah, you have to eat. Um, uh, so but that's, um, so that's anyway... Perfect. I've had a, a lot of fun creating the viewing room and it has some of my new paintings of tomatoes. Uh, it has some of my big bronze sculptures of the ballet dancers and of course some paintings of ballet and also a little bit of Nutella. Now I also saw that you on your YouTube page uh, that you also did something with uh, swan, black, the black swan. That oh, of was course. Beautiful. That was beautiful. Thank you. That, that was performance art. Am I right about that? Was it that was performance? performance art. I decided last October, I, I was missing everybody. I couldn't see any friends in person. Uh, mm -hmm. I couldn't talk to anybody. And I realized this time is going by and I decided to throw a barbecue. And of course, somebody asked, how can you throw a barbecue when we're all home? Even better. So I decided to do an online barbecue and studio visit so I could reach out. And about 50 people actually came to the barbecue. Uh, the sausages or virtually, physically or virtually. Virtually right here in my, in, uh, my space, in the studio here in Florence. Um, uh, the sausages did get burned on cue. Um, I actually cooked them. We had all kinds of uh, delicious foods, mozzarella cheeses and Parmigiano. And, I love and, Italian food. I, you know, I am, I'm Italian. I don't know if you know that. My parents, I, I, yeah, my parents were, my grandparents actually. My grandparents came from Sicily, so I'm Italian. Oh, that is, you should come and visit as soon as everything opens up. I, you should uh, I chase those to. family roots. I did go to Italy on my, when I got married, well, with my husband on my honeymoon, and it, there's oh. nothing like Italy. It is the most beautiful, beautiful place in the world. It really it is. is. Not, and it's if you're going to be on lockdown, that's the place to be. You better right have a, a, a tomato. Birds. 
No we filter on this tomato. That's the real tomato. The there. Um, but anyway, the, the idea was to about 50 people came. They came from Beverly Hills. They came from Sweden. They came from Switzerland. They came from, uh, from New York. They came from just uh, all over the world. About 50 friends actually came to the barbecue, including some of my collectors, some of my closest friends. Um, my friend uh, Chung from uh, Singapore, he had to set his clock for four o'clock in the morning to attend. And I decided besides going through the studio, I decided to create what's called the poetic moment. I thought it's time for everyone to take a deep breath and enjoy the barbecue, be with your friends. I never posted, I never publicized, except for there's a, a one minute video performed by Hanarata Perzanowska, who is an amazing dancer and a uh, choreographer from Poland. And she did a completely original version of Black Swan um, based, her choreography is based on the, the dying swan um, and that uh, Maya Plesikova, uh, Plesitskaya I, um, did. And it's just, just a moment to reflect. And I think right now we all need a, uh, a poetic moment. And for people who have been lucky enough to be uh, safe and reasonably healthy during this time, um, it has given us a, a moment to reflect. And it's really the challenge has been up to all of us. How do you use this time well and not just let it uh, pass us by? Well, you did a terrific job and we all love you because you are a beautiful artist. You are an amazing oh. person. And I want my audience to know where we can go to find out more information about you and your art. Do you have a website? You can start with kevinberlin.com. That's Kevin like Kevin Cosner, Berlin like the city in Germany.com. And if you go to kevinberlin.com forward slash or forward slash uh, viewing dash room. You'll be able to see all the new work. It's being launched this Sunday, right here in, uh, you know, worldwide. And, Fabulous. Fabulous. and of course I'm and on, in, on oh, YouTube. Yes, you are you on are. YouTube. Uh, the channel is Kevin Berlin. Bye. And if you just want to see a little bit of, uh, some art and some, uh, lifestyle and some, uh, everyday, uh, uh, fun and, perhaps a poetic moment, uh, God willing, um, on Instagram, Kevin Berlin. Kevin, I love you dearly. And I want to thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me here in New York. And I'm going to toast you big champagne kisses. Ooh, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a huge, huge, huge thank you. It's beautiful to be able to catch up. It's totally oh, no. unexpected and just such a pleasure. And if I was there, darling, I would give you a big pink champagne kiss, but I'll, I'll blow you I'll the pink you. champagne kiss. And thank you again. And don't go away, because I want to talk to you after we finish. Um, OK, and I, I promise you, when you come to Italy, we will share. Uh, if we can't find pink champagne, we'll have pink Prosecco, prosecco or fine. a glass of vino rosso, of uh, red, red wine. Thank you, darling. And we will be back with more celebrity interviews, darlings. Keep watching.
Okay, now we can finally put every microphone on and uh, have questions and answers.
hope you enjoyed my interview with famous artist Kevin Berlin, who resides now in Florence, Italy. Of course, the interview came all the way from Florence, Italy on Zoom. And we will be back with more celebrity interviews. And my channel is all about celebrity Zoom interviews and fabulous shopping hauls with Shein, Victoria's Secret, Bath and Body Works, Pretty Little Things, Rainbow, uh, and Amazon, my favorite. And don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and always ring the notification bell to let you know when I publish a new video. I always publish a video every Sunday or every Monday. Pink champagne kisses. Hello, darlings. You've all heard of Marilyn Monroe. Some of you know Bridget Fardell. Well, now it's time for the cognac show. I said cognac, ooh, ooh. I said cognac, ooh, ooh, ooh. I'm a bubbly blonde, fabulously dressed to impress. One of a kind girl I was brought into this world Wrapped up in pearls I love to mingle Though my husband reminds me I'm not single I meet and greet both the famous and the elite I ride in limousines drinking the finest champagne Wearing first dazzling diamond jewelry A girl can't complain I live in upscale life Dining in the finest restaurants, eating the best caviar for free. And no matter how much I eat cognac, ooh, ooh. I said cognac, ooh, ooh, ooh. This has been a Crybaby Productions, darlings.